election time. We are standing on the shoulders of our ancestors who gave their very lives that you and I might exercise our constitutional rights to vote as citizens of these yet to be United States of America. Sydney, we stand at the crossroads of history, similar to Joseph as he stood before Pharaoh in a time of impending crisis within our scripture lesson. Our theme this year, Brother Clooney, given to us by your lovely daughter, was, is, let your light shine. And Sister Cheryl, never has there been a calling more urgent than right now. That is to let your light shine. Beloved, let us go back down memory lane. Sister Cannon, it was in November of 2008, we experienced the greatest political election in the history of our world, arguably. In the prophetic words of the slain hip-hop star, Sister Mary Tupac, all eyes were on us, and we stepped up to the challenge. The world watched to see how the greatest country in the free world was going to respond to the greatest election of all times in light of the fact that the election was infested with the prevailing issues of racism, sexism, classism, elitism, as well as ageism. Church, we heard the political propaganda that overshadowed the serious political issues of, the, of that day. Obama was too young and McCain was too old. Obama was too smart and arguably McCain was labeled as being too dumb. McCain was too privileged and Obama was too poor. Obama was too hip and McCain was too lame. Obama was too cool and McCain uh, was conniving. McCain was supported by John Hagee and Obama was pastored by the Hamilton by the great genius known of Chicago Southside, Jeremiah A. Wright Jr. McCain was a war hero and Obama still today is mislabeled as an outrageous terrorist and Muslim by right-wing conservatives. McCain was a good old boy and Obama was a bad brother from the south side of Chicago. Beloved, we overcame all of this senseless propaganda through the electoral process and our country concluded that Barack Hussein Obama would be our president. Church without question, 16 years ago, we tapped into greatness. <laughs> Beloved, now it's 2024. Barack has left the White House. Hillary Clinton did not make it to the White House. And Biden will leave the White House as his term is inevitably up. To that end, it's time to tap into greatness once again. At this inevitable, inevitable changing of the guard, we still are in a political and economic quagmire. We struggle terribly to control the dissemination of illegal guns on our street. The Justice Department has provided little to no help in an effort to preserve black and brown lives, from the hands of police culture that is unnecessarily militaristic. Our lack of commitment to wholesome immigration policy invites insensitive and malicious rhetoric and attacks toward those who are in need, toward those who are most vulnerable. Beloved, if we are not careful, following the admonition of Kyle and Kenneth, we are in verge of the destruction at the hands of Project 2025 and the fascist preoccupation of a bully who wants to be a tyrant over those who are humane and sensible. When they tell us that voter suppression is election security, we need to serve it. When they claim that walls of exclusion will make us safer, we need to serve it. When they package authoritarianism as strong leadership, 
we need divine gift of seeing through the fog of deception to the clear light of truth. Beloved, as we somersault into the scriptures, there is a problem in the land. Pharaoh needs help. Pharaoh is in dire need of social, political, and economic leadership. Church, a wise person, knows that when they have a problem, it's logical to ask for help. Don't let your pride get in the way. If you have a problem, ask for help. Can I get a witness this morning? Church, if your health is failing and you want a better quality of life, get some help from your doctor, a trainer, or a nutritionist. If you're drowning in consumer debt, get some help and figure out how to get out of debt. If your children are struggling in school, you bring them here to Lula B. Sherman United Methodist Church to get some help. We have teachers, writers, mathematicians, and disciplinarians of all kinds who can help provide them with help. If you're depressed, oppressed, and contemplating suicide, reach out for help. There is someone to help you. If you have a problem, we have a God who can solve them, a God who has more resources than we can count. Only thing you have to do is ask for help. Church Pharaoh's problem was that he was suffering from nightmares. He had bad dreams. He had two bad dreams in particular. The first, he dreamt about seven healthy cows that were feeding in meadows. And then the second dream, he uh, dreamt of seven ugly, unhealthy cows that stood by a river bank, eventually being eaten by the healthy cows. Secondly, he dreamt about seven heads of grains that were plump and healthy. And then seven blinded heads of grains that appeared to be devoured by the selfie heaven, healthy, and plump heads of grain. Church, Pharaoh was devastated by his dreams as he did not know what they meant. Have you ever had a crazy dream and thought to yourself, what is this mess that is clogged in my head? Have you ever been there? Yes. So Pharaoh called on all the magicians, all the wise men in Egypt to interpret his dream, and unfortunately, everyone who he called on was of no help because they could not interpret the dream. Have you ever reached out to someone and they were no help? And you just had this look of disgust like, you are wasting my time. Coming highly recommended by Pharaoh's chief servant, Pharaoh calls on Joseph to interpret his dream. Joseph interpreted the dream and told Pharaoh that the dreams are one. God showed Pharaoh what God was about to do. The seven good cows are seven good years, and the seven good heads are seven good years, and the seven thin, ugly cows and the seven empty heads of blighted in the east wind were seven years of famine. God was foreshadowing to Pharaoh what was going to happen. As a result of interpreting the dream, now Joseph gave the recommendation to Pharaoh to select a discerning and wise man to rule over Egypt and collect one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven plentiful years in an effort to store up the reserves of the land for the seven years of famine in Egypt so that the land may not perish during the famine. Pharaoh appreciated Joseph's interpretation of his dreams and appointed him as second in command in Egypt. In essence, Joseph, Sister Carter, was the president, the secretary of state, the secretary of agriculture, and the chairman of the Securities Exchange Commission all at the same time. When Egypt and surrounding countries were enduring significant socioeconomic hardship, but Joseph worked the plan. Church, when Pharaoh back was up against the wall, Pharaoh tapped into greatness and asked Joseph for help to interpret his dreams. The relevant question this morning is why, why oh why, did Pharaoh tap into greatness and elect Joseph as his second in command? 
Beloved, I submit to you this morning that Pharaoh tapped into greatness and elected Joseph because, one, he had an impeccable reputation. Joseph was recommended by the chief butler who he met while he was in prison. Joseph interpreted the chief butler's dreams and told him that he would be restored to his old position. And you know what? It came to pass. Church, I stopped by here this morning to, to let somebody know that your gifts, but more specifically, your reputation will make room for you and bring you before great men. Before going to prison, Joseph was a faithful servant in Potiphar's house. Even though Potiphar's no good wife had an itch that could not be scratched and uh, tried to get Joseph to scratch her itch, she lied on him and Joseph uh, was reliable and he knew that his master uh, depended on him to do what was right. His reputation mattered. Joseph, before uh, uh, his trifling brother sold him into slavery, Joseph was his, was his father's favorite son because Joseph aimed to please his father. Joseph didn't mind tattling on his brothers when they goofed off on the job because Joseph wanted to honor his father by doing his best work. Joseph's brothers did not realize that Joseph had favor with his daddy because he had character. Joseph was honest. Joseph was trustworthy. Joseph was committed to his father's business. Reputation matters. Like Joseph, we need to bring integrity back to the house of the Lord. We have charlatans who are lying. Who, who haven't set foot in a black church trying to tell us about our agenda and who we should vote for and who we should not vote for in the name of upholding white supremacy. The devil is a liar. Amen. Amen. Beloved in church, we got holy rollers. We, we, we got con artists in church. You know, on Monday, we lie. On Tuesday, we cheat. On Wednesday, we steal. On Thursday, we gamble. On Friday, and hustlers of the gospel for our own personal gain. We must study God's word to show ourselves approved. We must give hope. We must speak truth to power. Joseph had a reputation and it brought him before great men. Secondly, Pharaoh tapped into greatness and elected Joseph because Joseph was an overcomer. Church, a few years ago, I had the awesome opportunity to meet Bishop Desmond Tutu from South Africa. He came to speak here in Chicago, and I met him downtown man, at the Chase Bank building, you know, the tall one down there on Monroe Street. And Bishop Tutu, as you know, uh, was a Nobel Peace Prize winner who fought apartheid in South Africa, Brother Basil. Bishop Tutu recounted in an interview that he had with a reporter at the BBC uh, in Great Britain. The reporter asked Bishop Tutu, what does it take to be a Nobel laureate? And Bishop Tutu uh, responded to Bench. He said, you have to have an easy name. You must have an easy name. <laughs> My name is Tutu, 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 Tutu. He said, you must have a big white nose, a big white nose. And he said, and additionally, to having an easy name and a big nose, you must have sexy legs, sexy legs. <laughs> Bishop Tutu explained that Nobel laureates don't fall from the sky. Bishop Tutu said that he was a ghetto child who was reared in abject poverty, but he said with God's grace, he looked apartheid in its evil eyes and said, yea, though they slay me, yet will I trust him. And he knocked out the treacherous institution of racism that was in his path. Church Bishop Tutu said it's not where you're from, but it's where you're going. Church, Joseph did not inherit a real estate 
a portfolio from his racist dad. His father was not a man of means. His earthly father was a poor man. Church, Joseph's father and grandfather were not admirals in the United States Navy. Joseph did not attend Harvard or Yale on the basis of a legacy admission. Joseph did not marry a wealthy woman from a prominent political family to catapult his political career in the state of California. Joseph did not earn millions of dollars off of private defense contracts. Joseph came from a dysfunctional family. But despite their dysfunctionalism, God blessed them tremendously. Joseph's daddy was what? He was a liar, liar, a cheater, a thief. Joseph's daddy deceived his father and cheated his older brother Esau and stole his blessing that he was entitled to by law of the firstborn. And to make it worse, Joseph's grandmama told his daddy to do it. But Joseph's daddy wrestled with God and God wrestled with him and his daddy would not let go until God blessed him. God changed his name from Israel, which means he who wrestles with God and he became one of the patriarchs of God's chosen people. Church and Joseph's family, it seemed like blood was not thicker than water because Joseph's brothers were jealous and envious of him. Commentators have suggested that it stemmed from sibling rivalry because of issues with what we know in contemporary terms as baby mama drama. Anybody know anything about baby mama drama? <laughs> the commentators reported that Joseph's brothers were jealous of him because his father loved Joseph's mother more than their mother. Joseph grew up without his mother during a significant portion of his childhood because she died in childbirth with his younger brother. Joseph was separated from his family against his will and sold into slavery, but somehow Joseph made it to Pharaoh's court. Beloved, the point that I'm trying to make for you this morning is that your future is not predicated on your past or current situation because tomorrow is the dawning of a brand new day. Beloved, there's no one who's too lost that can't be found. There's no one who's too low that can't be lifted up. There's no one too far out that can't be reached. Beloved, there's no one who's too dirty that can't be washed up. There's no one who's too hungry that can't be filled. There's no one who's too thirsty that can't be satisfied. There's no one who's too broken that can't be fixed. There's no one who's too hurt that can't be helped. There's no one who's too uh, 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 sinful that can't be redeemed. There's no one who's too ill that can't be healed. There's no one who's too addicted that can't be anointed. And there's no one who's too sinful that You gotta know that God has infinite and awesome power to work out each and every one of those issues in your life. Thirdly, Pharaoh tapped into greatness and elected Joseph because he had skills. <laughs> Joseph was a dreamer and he knew how to interpret dreams. That's an essential skill that Pharaoh and the country needed at that time. Now church, can I get a witness that we all know from previous administrations the negative consequences of having a commander in chief who's ineffective. Lack of skills and intellectual fortitude will cause a country to fight a pointless war in Iraq. It will send our economy to hell in a handbasket. It will, it will cause an increase in violent crimes. It will perpetuate modern day slavery through what we know as a prison industrial complex. Finally, beloved, Pharaoh tapped into greatness and elected Joseph because he had a mind to work. Church Joseph did not rest on his laurels. Once he was elected, he went to work. Beloved, it's time to work to ensure that our children earn an equal and high quality education. 
no matter if their parents can pay for it or not. It's time to work and support our leaders to provide economic relief, create jobs, rebuild roads, federal buildings, lay the infrastructure for broadband and its meaningful transparency and oversight within government. It's time to work to reduce student loan rates to poor college graduates who are drowning in debt from high interest rates of student loans. It's time that we demand that these graduates get some relief, the same relief that banks and the auto industry had. It's time to work. So like Pharaoh, my beloved brothers and sisters, it's time to tap into greatness. Like Joseph, we need a good reputation. Like Joseph, we need to be an overcomer. Like Joseph, we need skills. And like Joseph, we need to do the work and to work tirelessly for the betterment of humanity. Beloved, I don't know about you this morning, but I'm happy. I'm happy and happy as happy can be. And I'm thanking God this morning, Professor, that Pharaoh tapped into greatness. But I'm also happy this morning that a few generations on down the line, in the line of Joseph, God tapped into greatness one more time. This was from a man from Nazareth. He was known as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And when Peter and Andrew found him, Nathan said, is there anything good that can come out of Nazareth? He may have been from a ghetto, but I'm so glad that I serve a God that taps into greatness. Oh, Sister Carter, he was born in a manger because there was no room at the Sheraton Marriott Embassy Suites, the Empress Hall, the Harris Hotel in Bethlehem. But I'm so glad that my God tapped into greatness. He went from town to town healing the sick, raising the dead, feeding the hungry, and he gave sight to the blind. He did all of these awesome things. And that's why I'm glad this morning that my God taps into greatness. Peter denied him, Judas betrayed him. He went from judgment hall to judgment hall and they found no fault in him and they still made him carry a cross up Galgotha's hill. But I'm glad this morning that I serve a God that taps into greatness. Oh, we told the story this morning, Brother Archie, that they hung him high and they stretched him wide. They nailed his hands to the cross. But the Son of God said, Father, forgive them. Yeah. 
professor. This little light of mine, I'm feeling it today. Can we put those hands together? Church. We need new lights. 